you all are mine. David Crash. The sinful messiah. It just became a fear game. A massacre was coming. We're gonna die. The Crashians, time was up. Welcome back to another episode of Rise and Fall. Today we are going to be looking at the highly publicized massacre of a religious community living in Waco, Texas that resulted in the deaths of over 75 members. About a third of those victims were children. And we're actually going to be speaking to a survivor of the Waco standoff. This now infamous group are sometimes called Branch Davidians, but it might be more accurate to refer to them specifically as Koreshians, named for their leader, David Koresh. While this group has been called a cult, and absolutely culty sh went down that we do not condone for any reason, this case is used to illustrate the danger of calling a group with beliefs outside your own a cult. A word that others and dehumanizes people, making those vulnerable to religious oppression a target. So who was the man who took as many spiritual wives as he wanted, including minors, and somehow still manages to come off more sympathetically than the US government in most contemporary retellings? Let's get into this nonsense. Originally named Vernon Howell, David Koresh was born in Houston, Texas in 1959. He later legally changed his name for publicity and business purposes, choosing the names of important biblical kings from Judaic lore, including King David, whom he believed he was reincarnated as. His childhood was difficult. Koresh's mother had him at just 14. Biological father absent, stepfather physically abusive from his infancy. He spent long periods with his grandparents, feeling isolated and lonely. He dropped out of high school after years of bullying and struggling with his dyslexia, and he claims he was sexually assaulted by peers at least twice in his youth. During this time, music was one of his few talents, joys, and escapes. His mother and grandmother were practicing Seventh-day Adventists, so he grew up observing the Ten Commandments literally, following strict moral codes that didn't allow smoking, drinking, or fornication. He later claimed God spoke to him as a child, telling him that he was the Chosen One and Messiah. The Church of Seventh-day Adventists served as a formative social space for him. Unlike school, it was one of the few places he easily commanded the attention and respect of his peers, as well as cultivated relationships with women, both platonic and sexual. He became fascinated with the concept of Armageddon. At the dawn of the new millennium, after attending a series of graphic revelation seminars at the church, he even tried to convince the congregation that they needed a new prophet and a new light ahead of the apocalypse. Maybe even, oh, I don't know him? They not only rejected this idea, they expelled him entirely for being a bad influence on young people in the community. And of course, after that, he briefly moved to Los Angeles to become a rock star. If there's anything we've learned in this series, it's for the love of God. Swipe left on that musician. Just stay away from them. By 1981, he had given up on Hollywood and made his way to an opposite vibe. Waco, Texas. Here he joined the Branch Davinians, a religious offshoot of the Seventh-day Adventists he had grown up with. The history of the Branch Davidians begins in 1935, when Bulgarian immigrant Viktor Hatif settled on a remote piece of land 10 miles outside of Waco, where they built the Mount Carmel Center, a 77-acre compound and headquarters for their movement to bring about a Davidic kingdom during the imminent apocalypse, based on the empire of biblical King David. At its peak, they had 1,400 members, though over the decades, leadership changed hands several times, causing various rifts. Koresh quickly found his place at Mark Carmel under the mentorship of his lover, Lois Rodin. Over 40 years his senior and the widow of the former leader, Benjamin Rodin, she succeeded him and served as Branch Davidian's current leader and prophetess. Um, red flag. <laughs> Koresh kind of grew up in a very bad place and definitely has mommy issues. He needed the comfort of someone who kind of knew a little bit more about the world. But also he was low-key boinking her because she had been married to the original leader. He's not like totally innocent. When Rodin died, a power struggle ensued between Koresh and her son, George, which culminated in a dramatic gunfight in 1987. George was shot and Koresh and his accomplices were tried for attempted murder. All were eventually acquitted and Koresh's case was declared a mistrial. 
With the trial behind him in 1990, Koresh finally became the leader of the community of Branch Davidians living at Mount Carmel. My name is Joanne Viega. I was six years old when I was released from the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas. Hello! Hi. Come on in! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So were you born into the Branch Davidian or did you kind of come in later at a certain age? I wasn't born into it. My mom, she had met David and from my understanding, my mom was the driving force to us being in Waco and being part of the Branch Davidians. My dad kind of, you know, followed suit. Koresh didn't much change the isolation that ruled over Mount Carmel, but he did recenter the narrative around himself as the Messiah, a sole messenger to interpret the Bible's meaning and deliver it to the masses. That being said, followers were technically free to leave if they felt their beliefs were no longer in alignment with Koresh's preaching. When I was younger, the day-to-day -day was very peaceful. We did a lot of Bible studies, lots of godly singing songs and learning about the Bible. I was alone a lot. There was not anything entertaining. It was basically you and your imagination. He called his 130 or so followers Koreshians, over a hundred of whom he convinced to come live at the Koreshian compound while touring and preaching across the US, Israel, Australia, and the UK. He told them that it was their duty as the chosen people to prepare both for war and the end times, predicted in the book of Revelation. I think my mom was just in a place where she was looking for validation for her life and a direction of where she wanted to go. As you look at the progression of the group, he did switch his rhetoric to, I can help you, I can point the way to God, and then it became, well, I am God, and I am the savior, and you all are mine. He maintained control over most of their day-to-day -day life, from arranging where they slept to dictating their diets. For example, sugar, processed flour, and dairy products were forbidden. And his rationale for those decisions was largely personal. He didn't like adults drinking milk because he thought it was baby food. From what my sister had told me, my mom had tried to leave a couple times. My dad told my mom, like, you can leave, but you're not taking Joe. I don't know what happened where my dad switched and was like, no, we're, this is it. We are the group that's going to heaven, you know? Everyone's gonna die, everyone's gonna go to hell, and we're the only one going to heaven. If you could not be obedient, you were disciplined. This could be just a verbal shaming, but in some cases, it could also be physical punishment. That's when all the fear really set in because you came from someone who's gonna help you find your way to he's the only way. My advice like, the end times are coming. What I believe is the truth. I think it's to scare people into looking for answers. I definitely think that like at this point, I would feel very like it's time to either start leaving or thinking about start leaving. Maybe if you were in it in the moment, maybe it made sense, but I would think that a red flag or two or three or five would pop up, but I don't know why it didn't. He had at least 13 children within the movement amongst his various spiritual wives. Dana Okimoto, mother of one of Koresh's children, said of her experience, quote, if there is one thing I could take back, I would take back the spankings. The children were sometimes disciplined using a wooden paddle, perhaps even to the point of bleeding. He preached celibacy for all of his followers, including married couples, but justified knowing so many of his female followers in the biblical sense using theology. Any children born of him would be sacred and their mothers became privileged members of the House of David. I think somebody's bending the rules a little bit. Yeah, I'm getting out of there. He was legally married to one woman, Rachel Jones. But according to Kiwi Jewel, one of his spiritual wives, he had as many as 20 wives, some of whom were underage. Jewel herself was the youngest of them, as she testified before Congress that Koresh molested her and made her into a bride when she was just 10 years old. Her mother was also one of his wives. Multiple investigations into alleged sexual abuse by Koresh were inconclusive, but a number of children who grew up in the community said that Koresh molested them. David Buns says of Koresh's abuse of power, quote, my position now is that David Koresh was a pedophile and I wish I would have done something. I'll call it a cult, that's what it was. 
It's people doing things they wouldn't normally do, like giving up their wives and letting their children have sex with adults, which is crazy. But that's what you do when you're in a cult. Toward, I'd say, the last year, then it became more structured. You had to be with a parent all the time. It felt heavy and fearful. Who could have guessed this group would soon be the target of what the New Yorker calls, quote, probably the largest military force ever gathered against a civilian suspect in American history. By 1992, local media and authorities began questioning the ethics and legality of the Koreshian lifestyle. We were told that everyone outside of our gates were very bad people. If we saw someone, we were supposed to notify an adult right away. The narrative had switched to, you're gonna die. These bad people were gonna come and kill us all. Whispers of the word cult were at the center of the storm. A social worker with Child Protective Services looked into them, but unable to find any evidence of child abuse, the case was closed. That year, the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, also known as AATF, also began investigating reports of an illegal weapons cache hoarded at Mount Carmel. Koresh notably was an arms enthusiast who did capitalize on the trade at local gun shows. We did know that the ATF was camping out across the street from us. We were told that when he was to come in that we were you know, basically trying to get him to join our group, but we did know that he was spying on us. And we were supposed to act normal. I think that was the only time we were ever allowed to eat meat. It, I mean, it was obviously just a show for David to say like, look, we're normal, we're all normal people. There's nothing to worry about. Have you found God? Come this way. At this point, it kind of looks like he has his ear to the ground and he knows he's about to be found out. If your leader is panicking, you're gonna panic. On February 27th, 1993, the Waco Tribune Herald published their first installment of The Sinful Messiah, an investigative series looking into David Koresh. Perhaps by divine timing or cosmically bad timing, the following day, the ATF attempted to raid the compound to execute a search warrant. Walk us through what you remember about the siege. The first day I'd gotten up my mom was downstairs, she was cooking breakfast. She came upstairs because we lived on the second story. Our window was actually facing the very front, so there's a big long road that I could see all the way down to the gate. She came in and she said, you know, get changed. And like a true six-year-old, I kind of dawdled and didn't listen. And you could see as you looked out the window, these like little black dots a lot of them coming down the driveway. Shortly after that, it was just gunfire everywhere. And my mom ran in the room and she grabbed me off the bunk bed. I was sitting on the top and she put me on the floor. She laid on top of me and she just told me, you know, just be quiet. They moved the kids and the women to the back because the fronts where all the gunfire was. And they put us under a bed and put pillows everywhere and it was just basically a be quiet, you know, don't, don't say anything. I don't have much memory after that. Chaos ensued and to this day, no one knows who shot first. But what is clear is that in the wake of the initial gun battle was that five ATF agents and five Koreshians were dead and dozens more injured. At that point, there were 62 adults and 21 children remaining at Mount Carmel all of whom refused to leave. What followed was an unprecedented 51-day standoff between the Koreshians and the FBI, who took over the botched case from the ATF. It just became a fear game every day. They did teach us a lot about identifying helicopters and planes and guns and things like that because it just became about war. Over the span of those 51 days, FBI negotiators had 117 conversations with Koresh, totaling over 60 full hours of negotiation in an attempt to gain access to the site, which he consistently refused. He's directly communicating with the ATF, so he's fully in charge. They're cut off from the entire world. They have no control over the situation. That's so scary. I remember walking through the hallway. There was bullet holes everywhere. It was at night. They had the big spotlight lights on the house so you could see 
all the gun holes, through the ceiling, through the windows, through the walls. During the standoff, the FBI used sleep deprivation tactics on the Davidians, including floodlighting the compound and blasting violent audio recordings of animals being killed. The forces include 12 tanks, four combat vehicles, and a force of about 900 law enforcement agents, including Army personnel, Texas National Guard and Rangers, as well as officers of the Texas Department of Public Safety, McLennan County Sheriff's Office, and Waco Police. Over time, however, they were able to secure the release of 44 people living at the compound. The morning was a blur. When I was released, I was with my mom and she had told me that they were releasing children. She went to David and basically said, you know, she's not your child. Is there any way we can release her? And he granted that. So she came back up, got me dressed, and basically was like, you're getting out of here. I didn't have anything except for a jacket. She wrote a quick little note to my sister and she put her necklace that she was wearing in my coat basically gave me a hug with my dad at the front door, and that was it. That was the last time I saw both my parents. In part, the siege lasted as long as it did because the Koreshians were waiting to see if one of their leader's biblical prophecies would be fulfilled, predicting that they would be attacked, killed, and resurrected during Passover, which took place between April 6th and 13th that year. When that never happened, on April 14th, Koresh sent a letter outlining his plan to come out, contingent on giving him time to write essentially a liturgical end-of-days manifesto. He also signed contracts to retain his defense attorney. But by then, the patience of the negotiators had grown thin. FBI negotiator Byron Sage described the situation on April 15th as being a, quote, total impasse, end quote. His words were conveyed to then Attorney General Janet Reno, who was under pressure to approve an assault on the compound. The Crescians, time was up. A massacre was coming. Time Magazine might have put it best. Quote, the sun didn't blacken, nor the moon turn red, but the world did come to an end, just as their prophet had promised. At 6 a.m. on April 19, 1993, the FBI began their raid on Mount Carmel. The Koreshians attempted to get the FBI to repair the severed phone line to negotiators, but officials would not repair it. Instead, they sent in tanks and rammed through the walls to launch heavy amounts of tear gas over the span of six hours. Amid the chaos of the raid, a fire broke out and completely engulfed the building. To this day, no one knows how the fire started, which according to the FBI, erupted from three separate points. The official post-incident reports blamed the Koreshians for starting the fire and for shooting each other in consensual suicides, according to NPR. However, some critics maintain decades later that the FBI raid itself inadvertently caused the fire. Tear gas is notably an unstable substance linked to various fires, though some experts say that would have been more likely if they had been using tear gas grenades, which the FBI denies using. They also deny firing any guns that day. By the end of the day, only nine Koreshians survived. 76 of them were dead, including all of the children. Most victims died of smoke inhalation, but others died by more violent means that may have been acts of suicide. A three-year-old boy was found dead from stab wounds, and two other minors suffered fatal blows to the head. Koresh was found dead with a gunshot wound in the middle of his forehead. One of the few Koreshian survivors, David Thibodeau, went on record to say he believed it was impossible anyone living in the compound would have started the fire and believed there were Koreshians shot by the FBI that day. Though, he also admits it is likely some may have shot each other in an attempt to avoid a longer or more painful death by fire. I didn't realize so many Koreshians were killed. I don't think I really let that sink in. All of the children. All of the children. They never got a choice in any of it. The execution of getting the members out of the cult was done so horribly, in my opinion. I understand why they were scared. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you think is sort of misunderstood or mistold about the Branch Davidians or even the siege itself? It kind of depends on, you know, who you're hearing this information from. There are some survivors that still 
believe that David's coming back. Some people are very graceful in understanding that the people that were in there maybe were brainwashed. People, you know, think that we're all the same. It's a little bit more than that. There are people there that were not 100% in the faith. A day after the raid, then-President Bill Clinton backed the FBI's handling of the case despite the heavy death toll, telling the press, I do not think the United States government is responsible for the fact that a bunch of religious fanatics decided to kill themselves. All nine Koreshian survivors were put on trial and convicted for various offenses, but have since been released from federal prison. How was life for you after you were released from the Branch Davidians? It was rough. My childhood after Waco was a very big learning experience for both me, my sister, who got custody of me. We had therapists saying that I would become a mass murderer when I grew up, so that was kind of the narrative. It just took my sister and I a very long time to be able to function as a family or what you know, we thought a family was supposed to be. With time, the narrative surrounding what really happened at Waco began to shift. Footage of life in the compound that the FBI had made sure was not released during the siege became public, showing peaceful, normal, thoughtful children, teenagers, and adults. Sociologists began to question the government and media's tactics of focusing on Koresh as a cult leader and the harm it did in dehumanizing everyone else at Mount Carmel making them disposable, easily written off, easily killed. There was also backlash from the political far right, who saw Waco as a cautionary tale of big government overstepping. Two years later, Timothy McVeigh, a right-wing anti-government domestic terrorist, enacted the Oklahoma City bombings, partly in response to Waco, as he had traveled to Texas to briefly witness the siege. You know, you have to play this card of how to fit in not having the same experiences that other people had, that's in itself a full-time job. I can't contribute me not being, you know, a crazy person to one life big event that changed me, but it was more of like every day, those little decisions that you make, those are the things that I think made a big difference. It's an inner working every single day to make choices, like choose to be a different person. What David Koresh did to women and girls on the compound is unforgivable. Is there something about, you know, society that you think kind of contributes to things like this to happen? If it's a blunt answer, I think it's a parenting problem. I don't think that the world will ever be short of people who are looking to take advantage of other people. So we have to teach our children. We have to love our kids through these times so that way when they are an adult, they can make decisions for themselves, that they don't make the same decision that my mom made. The world does not need another strong woman. We have enough of those. What we need is kinder men. I have three really great boys that I'm raising to hopefully be kind, confident, and strong men, but graceful. Thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you, thank you very much for having me. Can we give you a hug? Yes. Maybe no one will know the truth of what happened at Waco. But there are some facts that remain. A man who abuses his power to sleep with children is trash. Our government loves to flex its military budget and those people should not have died. The rest, as they say, is history, which is generally told by the victors. But I don't see a ton of winners in this story. Join us next week for another episode of Rise and Fall. Next episode, we look into one of the first cults of the internet age and their obsession with an extraterrestrial afterlife.